誒、呃、各位誒、呃、先生女士，歡迎嚟臨香港考古學會主辦香港歷史博物館贊助場地嘅考古講座。Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the archaeological lecture organised by the Hong Kong Archaeological Society. The Museum of History is our venue sponsor tonight. 今晚嘅講題係二零一二年大嶼山散頭唐代墓群的發現。及二零一三年鹽田仔考古調查計劃，講者係中香港中文大學人類學系助理教授協理范文浩博士。Tonight's topic is GPR survey and archaeological excavation of a Tang cemetery at San Tao Lantau Island, plus introducing the 2013 survey com excavation of Yim Tien Jai at Sai Kung. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Mick Arthur, who is adjunct professor, uh, adjunct assistant professor from the Department of Anthropology, at the University of、uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. 今晚嘅講座會以英語進行。Tonight's、uh, lecture will be、uh, presented in、uh, in English. 喺講座開始之前。請大家關掉你哋嘅手提電話，響鬧裝置。誒、呃、喺場內不能不可吸煙，誒、呃、亦不準飲食。如果各位需要使用誒、呃、相機拍照，請關掉你哋嘅閃光燈。Um, please, uh, before we start, please, uh, switch off your mobile phones, uh, pagers, or any alarming devices. Uh, please do not smoke, eat, or drink in this venue. And if you wish to take photos tonight, please do not use flashlight, as、uh, Dr. Arthur will have a headache <laughs> from, from all the flashes. 誒喺講座開始之前，我哋而家請香港考古學會主席吳偉雄先生為誒大家簡介今晚嘅講座。Uh, before we start, we, we please uh, welcome uh, the chairperson of Hong Kong Archaeological Society, Mr. Stephen Ng, to uh, briefly introduce uh, the talk tonight for you. Thank you.、Uh, good evening. A、uh, uh, warm welcome, everyone, to attend this、uh, the lecture presented by the Dr. Albert.、Uh, Dr. Albert's uh, uh, Carrying out two archaeological excavation at Shantou, and will carry out、uh, coming the excavation in the Yim Tien Jai Chun. Because of Dr. Albert、uh, presented in English, may I have to summarize in Cantonese what do you, what he finding, and what he, he want to excavate in Yim Tien Jai. Ah,、uh, 咁就大啊就。過去嗰兩年就喺汕頭嗰度咧，就啊，多謝 Alpha 就係用個 GPR 就揾到嘅唐代嘅墓葬嘅。咁嚟緊咧，佢今晚佢又會講一講即係嗰兩年嘅發現啦，同埋咧今晚咧佢亦都會講一講咧鹽田仔個發掘嘅一啲計劃咁樣嘅。啊、uh, ，OK， may I invite Dr. Alpha has a presentation。I've got a very loud voice, sir.、Um, and then we'll move on to talk about the forthcoming、uh, survey come excavation at Yim Tien Jai. So, the basic structure of tonight's talk: we'll ha have a brief introduction to、uh, the Santau site.、Uh, we'll look at the results of the 2011 investigation, and then move on to the second season of field work, and then. After we've done that, we'll then move on to introduce the forthcoming project, which my students from this year, there's a few of them managed to make it, not many,、um, will come out to site as part of their、uh, studies at Chinese U, and then we'll have some dates for the forthcoming project, so you can find out、uh, when things are going to happen. So Santau is in 
an interesting location. It's located on the north shore of Lantau Island. Um, before the airport was built, it looked out directly over the Pearl River, towards the Pearl River estuary, in a very important location in terms of Tang Dynasty history uh, in Hong Kong. The general setting of the settlement of, of Santau, which is down here, this is Santau village, and the area we investigate is this red square up here, which is a back beach, a raised back beach. These are all around the coastline of Hong Kong, piled up in prehistory and early historical times by typhoons, driving the sand beyond the beach and ra creating these raised platforms. And these were a magnet for people from the earliest times, from the Neolithic onwards. Um, so we have a short, steep valley with, surrounded by mountains, a fairly large stream which has formed this huge alluvial fan. So this is all material that's eroded from the hillsides, washed down the stream and spread out to create this low-lying area uh, overlooking Tong Chung Bay. Quick look at the geology. Um, here's the study area again at the top left. Uh, QD is debris flow. This is all around the, the base of hill slopes, all the way around Hong Kong. The granite erodes, it washes down the hillsides during rainy season and forms a kind of apron around the hills of clay-rich, bouldery kind of material. The QA is quaternary alluvium. This is material washed down by the stream. And the QB is the bit we're interested in, which is the back beach deposits. This is this raised sand body where the archaeology appeared to be. The pink areas are granite, fine granite or uh, medium granite over here. This is more or less what the site looked like when we first uh, visited. Um, the large flat area of the back beach uh, with fairly light scrub cover uh, by Hong Kong standards. Uh, the Yim Tin Tai site will not be as easy as this to clear. It's seriously overgrown. A um, bit more like the left-hand picture rather than the right-hand picture, unfortunately. Uh, the left-hand side is uh, a quite typical uh, terraced landscape, which we see all around Hong Kong and dating mostly from the Qing Dynasty, but also going back earlier than that, uh, where the farmers... Uh, used the low-lying land for paddy fields, but also terraced up the hillsides for um, other rice if they could get water there, or for growing things like peanuts or sweet potatoes or taro on the dry fields. So this is a fairly typical uh, rural landscape in the new territories of Hong Kong. Um, the first thing we did before we actually set foot in the field, of course, is to do some what's called desk-based assessment. We try and find out as much as we can about that particular area uh, without actually going out and starting the field work. So, as I've already mentioned, Tong Chung and Chun Mun, that area is historically associated with the Tang Dynasty military, who had a base at Chun Mun, and it's thought that maybe Tong Chung Bay was a secondary anchorage for the war junk patrols because it's very sheltered in most wind conditions in Hong Kong, whereas Chun Mun is slightly more exposed. So those two areas across the bay were probably connected in the Tang Dynasty. Um, and this seems to be the military activity is connected to the policing of the maritime trade flowing from the east and from the west into the Pearl River, and they were stopping at Chun Mun to get their papers checked before they headed up the river towards Panyu, what is now Guangzhou. Um, and we, of course, we have many Tang Dynasty sites in this area on what was Chetlak Kok, for example, and all the way around the coast of Lantau, we find lots of these uh, salt or lime kilns uh, dotted around these, these coastal sites. There were three previous investigations done at the site before we actually went out and did our field work. Um, the North Lantau survey done by the Chinese U team, uh, working on an area just beside the bit we actually looked at, and they just found Qing Dynasty materials there, so not so interesting. But then in the Tung Chung and Tai Ho comprehensive feasibility study, it's a bit of a mouthful, this is um, a commercial project where at the early stages when the Tong Chung area was being looked at with its potential for future development, uh, there was some commercial uh, archaeology carried out there. And that included a number of small shovel pits and a number of test pits. One of those test pits turned up um, several large sherds of pottery from a large jar with 60 or more Koyun hai <laughs> Tongbo coins. Koyun Tongbo, this is a classic Tang Dynasty coin. You find those, you know you've got a Tang Dynasty site. So the interpretation of that broken pot with the coins which look like they've been inside it maybe, uh, was that this might be a cemetery site. 
the second territory-wide survey of 1997 to 8. Uh, a team from uh, Guangzhou came in to help with that, and they excavated a 2 by 3 meter test pit just to the west of the area investigated by the, uh, the Mock Connell team. And that turned up what they thought was evidence for two further Tang Dynasty graves. They thought early Tang graves based on their, their findings, including uh, complete pots, hairpins, bronze ornaments, and an iron knife, but no human remains. In Hong Kong, it's very rare that we find human, human remains because we have very acid soils, and it's a very aggressive environment for organic remains to survive. So we had all these other indications that we had a graveyard with grave goods and hairpins and so on, but no actual bodies. So this was the kind of impression that those early investigations gave us about the site. We had a thin topsoil, Qing Dynasty in date probably, through to the middle of the 20th century, a Song cultural layer, probably Northern Song, and then a Tang Dynasty or Six Dynasties to Tang layer with graves cut into it, which also cut down into uh, a, a very sort of yellow sand at the base, which might be a prehistoric layer, we didn't know. This is the kind of uh, thing we expected to find. So we established, the first job was to establish a grid, um, a study area within which we could work. In, in this case, 50 meters north-south on this side, 50 meters north-south, and 100 meters east-west on this back beach area. And these are five meter grids. Uh, we then have this area, the blue outline is the area of the GPR survey, the Ground Penetrating Radar Survey. Um, the red square is the AMO excavation of 1998. The green square is the Mock Connell excavation of 1998. And the three pink squares were our first season planned test pits um, that we excavated in 2011. And we then expanded that area into this larger green trench which joined up two of those areas which seemed to be producing the most interesting results. So the research methodology then for that first season was firstly to use ground penetrating radar to survey a larger area, uh, 19 five meter grids, to see if we could pick up any evidence for these uh, supposed graves within the site. And then based on the findings of the GPR, we then positioned three test pits over specific targets picked up by the GPR that looked the most interesting areas for us to excavate. And then that was, oh, something's gone wrong with my formatting. And then we expanded, as I said, a larger area around two of those test pits. So this is the GPR survey in action uh, with the, uh, the GPR specialists operating the equipment on this uh, trolley. Here's the actual GPR antenna, this orange box with a GPS uh, receiver on top. So we were recording in three dimensions every reading that the GPR took. So we were recording everything in three dimensional space, which is very important. Um, that's how the survey was done. This is my attempt to try and explain in relatively simple terms what GPR does. Okay, so what we have, here is a site. This is the surface, the modern surface. We have three layers, a loose sand, a silty sand, and a gravelly sand. And then cutting into that silty sand layer, we have a grave, a Tang Dynasty grave, which has a couple of iron blades in it, swords, for example. In this top layer, which we'll say for the sake of sand tower would be a northern song deposit, it has some fired clay. Uh, this is from kiln debris. And then at the base of the deposit, there are a number of boulders and rocks, which are a natural deposit. Now, what the GPR does is it sends out uh, electromagnetic waves, pulses into the ground, and these are sent out at a known speed. So when they bounce back from objects buried in the ground, the time that it takes to come back reflects how deeply they are buried. So T1 is a short distance. It bounces back very quickly from these pieces of fired clay and gives you a good depth reading for those objects. It takes slightly longer to come back from the iron blades and longer still to bounce back from the, the boulders at the bottom. So these would be reflected in the radar gram in the results that the GPR gets and tell us that there are different objects at different depths buried in the site. The clever thing with the GPR as well is that it, we're also running this with a GPS, a global positioning system attached. So all these readings, these depths that we're getting, are also being recorded in three-dimensional space using satellites orbiting the Earth in space. So all these readings we get are exactly located in three dimensions in the ground. We also sur survey in the opposite direction, running across to form a grid 
of data. That means we can model a site in three dimensions. Now, this is incredibly interesting and useful for archaeologists. If we can model what's going on below the ground in three dimensions, it means we can have some kind of prediction of what we might find in different parts of the site. So this is the 2011 GPR survey result, which shows lots of interesting anomalies. All these bright areas, yellow, orange, red, and black, are things that look like archaeology, things that are giving a reflection against the site background. The site background of the Sandy Back Beach is all the kind of blue and pale blue and dark blue bits. That is the background. Anything that's kind of green, yellow, red, or black is probably archaeology. This is an area of 19 five-meter grids within a site that extends way, way beyond this area we surveyed. If this intensity of archaeology is evidenced across the wider site, then we're talking a substantial cemetery with lots and lots of burials. This trench on the right-hand side here is the actual finished profile of the 2011 excavation, showing some of the features that we investigated. So we started small with two by two meter test pits in three locations and quickly realized that excavating with such a small trench on this particular site with its very dry sandy soils was actually quite difficult to see uh, any evidence for the actual outlines of the graves. So we, we excavated down through the deposits and came down onto what looked like grave goods in two locations. Here's one cluster of grave goods, possibly a grave marker with this stone, a second grave marker, and another cluster of grave goods here with what looks like an iron sword sticking out of the corner of the trench. So we came down on the grave, but we couldn't see the grave outline. So we thought we need to do something different to try and investigate this site. So we opened up a larger area eventually. This is one of those graves we found in the 2011 excavation. This is grave G2, um, which produced a very rich haul of weapons, four different kinds of iron blade, a rapier edgeless stabbing, uh, stabbing weapon, a long knife, a single-edged long knife, a double-edged short sword, and a shorter knife. So this person was armed to the teeth. They had lots and lots of weapons. Um, one problem that we encountered, because we excavated the two by two test pit first, which came through here, uh, and then it went across like that, is that we didn't pick out the outline of the grave before we got down to the grave goods. Very difficult. Um, so what we have in the end found is that when we tried to follow the outline of the grave, there was another pit cutting in on this side, which rather confused uh, the issue. And so the outline of this grave should in fact go more across like that and encompass all of these grave goods. And the alignment of the grave, the, the body we suspect was probably laid out through here in this space between the two sets of weapons. So the grave is actually northwest, southeast orientated. So is this a warrior burial? It's a good question. It certainly looks like it, a soldier or somebody who was well armed. This is a, a drawing of that a grave showing, again, the weapons, the rapier, the short sword. Uh, also, interestingly, in between this cluster of uh, two blades is an iron adze, a woodworking tool, a long iron-bladed woodworking tool, uh, which was buried in a bundle with those two blades. So quite interesting. And in section, this is the layout of the, the, the items in the grave. This is the adze. Um, very well preserved and quite a substantial object, 15 centimeters long or so. Um, a socketed adze um, found with the long knife and the short sword. Um, as I've already mentioned, the adze suggests woodworking. It's specifically a woodworking tool, um, quite often used in terms of uh, boat building, very, very often associated with, associated with boat building. So maybe there is also, a, as well as a military connection, there's maybe a maritime connection. Uh, with this burial. The kind of uh, objects we, find, we found in, in many of the graves, this is from grave two, the, the one we just looked at, and this is a very nice, uh, small, crackle-glazed, green crackle-glazed bowl of a very uh, classic mid to late tang form uh, and well-preserved. A couple of other graves had what at the time I termed a pot-smashing ritual, which is uh, a rather strange thing. 
These two greys we think are both east-west orientated. Certainly uh, grave eight was, this one. Grave 11 was badly disturbed by a, a Qing burial cutting through it and also by uh, grave two which cut through here as well. But the pattern of these grey sherds from this smashed pot suggests that this grave originally was orientated east-west like grave eight. And in both these graves, we found large storage jars, a large storage jar here, and a large uh, pink coarse basin in this grave under large rocks, smashed to smithereens. If they'd placed a rock on the pot to seal it, they would have probably chosen a flat rock. This looked like they'd actually dropped the rock to kill the pot or to smash the pot. Now, I've come across other evidence of this in other parts of the world in prehistoric sites uh, where it's definitely seen as killing the object to allow it to pass over into the next world to be used by the person in the next life. I'm not suggesting that that is the case here, but it's very interesting that in these two graves of what we think is the same orientation, we have this uh, evidence of a rock being dropped on these large storage pots. Very interesting. Um, what we also had in this uh, grave G8 on the left here is good evidence without a body for the presence of a body. We had at this end here a hairpin that looks like it's probably in its original position. Across the middle of the grave where these two small mounds are here were a series of belt fittings, bronze, copper alloy belt fittings, a strap end, a buckle, and several qua, these decorations hanging from straps. Adopted by Tang Dynasty people from northern nomadic peoples and then became a very fashionable item during the Tang Dynasty. So without even having a body, we've got a hairpin, we've got a large pot smashed under a rock at the far end, and we've got the belt fittings in the middle. That suggests that the, the body was orientated with the head towards us, the feet by the rock, and that gave a length for the person of around 1.6 meters. So we could suggest that the person was 1.6 meters or maybe shorter, but probably not taller because they would have been squashed by the rock. The grave goods in, G in grave six, very well preserved bronze objects. This is one of the features of this site. The, the metalwork is incredibly well preserved. So we have these beautiful uh, strap end, which is formed from two plates riveted together and very finely made. And then this very nice long buckle, completely intact with the striker plate and the tang still in place. And you can see how finely made it is here, is, is here from this sectional view. And again, a perfectly preserved silver hairpin, which when it comes out of the ground actually looks purple. Silver, as soon as it's oxidized by the air, it goes from being a kind of grayish color to purple. So here's a silver hairpin. Here's that large basin that was smashed under the rock. The bits that survived, we managed to re reconstruct and stick together again. And that's the kind of layout of that grave there showing. Here's the hairpin, here's the belt fittings, and then here's the large basin under the rock, and that gives us a space within which the body must have been laid out. In the other area we excavated first, uh, Test Pit 1, this area was badly disturbed by Qing Dynasty terracing and agriculture. And it was very difficult to see anything higher up uh, during the excavation. We only realized that we were down into graves when we hit these very gray stained areas because the graves had been cut through the Qing Dynasty disturbed material into the yellow sand underneath. So once it got down into the yellow sand, we could then see the outline of the grave cutting in at that level. So here we have one grave running uh, east-west, northwest, southeast, sorry, which is grave one. And then we have grave four running north-south across here, two graves. The relationship between them is unclear. They appear to just about touch each other. When we cleaned away the dark staining in the bottom of this grave, we came across this very nice uh, Shiwan uh, made from Guangdong uh, wine jar with a, a spout and a series of lugs, horizontal lugs, four horizontal lugs around the edge, very similar to examples that were found in the Belitung wreck in Indonesia, which was a cargo of Tang Dynasty pottery, probably on its way to Southeast Asia or even to the Middle East, uh, full of Guangdong-made pottery. And the larger storage jars were jammed full with Changsha painted bowls. So they used the large jars to store the small bowls and cups inside the big jars. And this kind of pot was uh, a feature of that cargo, the Belitung wreck. It's a very nice report, a very uh, good online website of that. It's a very interesting uh, site to look at if you're interested in Tang Dynasty archaeology. 140 Hoyun Tongbo coins, the richest grave in terms of coinage on the entire site so far. Um, 
and interestingly, a harpoon head and a fish hook buried with this person. So again, we're having some indications of a maritime connection. Uh, harpoon heads, fish hooks, this grave being one of, the, one of the richer ones on the site. Here are some of those objects uh, from grave four. So there's that very nice uh, Chiwan uh, wine jar with the spout here, and then four lugs around the shoulder. A couple of very nice small cups, quite coarsely made, uh, but a pair of them buried by the feet of the deceased person, we think. A hairpin at the northern end near the wine jar. So again, we had a hairpin at one end and a couple of small bowls, which we think were probably by the feet. Um, this thing that looks like a guitar is, in fact, a ha harpoon head fused to a Hoyung Tombow coin. So it's a coin fused to an iron object. And a couple of nice bowls. This object is the base of a round-bottomed fu, uh, a, a storage or cooking jar dating to probably the Jin dynasty. This is probably quite a bit earlier than everything else on site. So whether this was an heirloom, something that was retained and passed down to be buried with this person, or whether it was an object lying around uh, from earlier activity that became incorporated in the grave, we're not absolutely sure. But it's certainly earlier than most of the things on site. The, the nearby grave to that, which is uh, also northwest southeast, the same as the other warrior burial, contained a large iron axe head. Again, very well preserved. And as you can see, these are five centimeter divisions on the scale. So this is about more than 15 centimeters long. So again, it's a sizable, uh, sizable tool or weapon. Buried next to, st standing upright next to this large basin. So the basin was standing in the end of the grave and just next to it was the ax standing on the ground next to it. And a very nice square qua. Two different kinds, D-shaped qua and these square qua, depending on the different grave. So again, nice objects in these graves. So this is a view of the overall area opened up in 2011. The original two by two test bit, test bit two is this small area in the middle. The original uh, two by two at test bit one is up here. And then we exp expanded to join these areas up to get a better understanding of what was going on in between. So let me go back. Overall, we excavated seven graves. Six of them dated to the mid to late Tang Dynasty. One of them appeared to be a Qing intrusion. Uh, a, a number of other graves were possible graves as well, which we didn't get a chance to excavate. Um, the important thing to observe in the GPR data relative to the archaeology, the excavated, excavated remains, is this correlation between these very strong responses and the warrior grave with all those weapons in. So it's picking up all the metalwork very strongly. And also uh, grave G1, which had that iron axe in, a great big lump of metal again. So that is giving a very strong response with the GPR. Also, the top of G4 has got that cluster of uh, harpoon uh, and a, a knife and uh, 140 coins. So again, that is being picked up by the GPR and giving us a very strong signal. Other graves in between didn't get picked up by the GPR because they didn't have much in the way of metalwork. Um, so this is obviously a, an issue in terms of how we detect graves that don't have lots of iron or other metal objects in them. We'll come back to that later in the talk when we look at the evidence from the second year's uh, fieldwork. So what we found from the 2011 findings was that GPR works very well in a back beach site in Hong Kong. The sandy uh, back beach conditions are perfect for ground penetrating radar. Um, and all those anomalies that we were seeing in the GPR data are archaeology. So those results suggest that there is a lot of archaeology in that site. So the cemetery uh, seems to extend across the entire back beach, and it could contain you know, several hundred individuals if you look at the whole area. We found in the first season 16 probable burials. As I said, seven were fully excavated, and six of those were mid to late Tang in date. Very interesting that there was such a variety of grave goods assemblages. So gr different graves with quite different uh, things being placed with the, the deceased person. Some with many weapons, looked like maybe uh, warriors or soldiers of some sort. Some with no weapons at all. Some with lots of coins apparently fairly wealthy burials, and then others with very few. And then this repeating pattern of finding harpoons and fish hooks, uh, suggesting some kind of maritime connection for these people. 
We also have this strange, what I've called this pot-killing ritual, uh, evidenced in these two graves on the same east-west orientation. As far as I know, I've not found any other evidence for that on other sites in Hong Kong. Um, maybe somebody else will find some in the future. All of the pottery is from Guangdong, uh, which is kind of what you might expect. The, the lots of pottery kilns, lots of producers in the Guangdong area supplying uh, the local needs of the community. Uh, so if these are soldiers based in the area, they're just using locally made uh, ceramics. However, the copper alloy belt fittings, the coir de strap ends and the belt buckles, uh, were identified as being of northern manufacture by a specialist at Chinese U. Um, very good quality and probably not locally produced. So these have either been sent south to markets in maybe Guangzhou, or Panyu, or they've traveled south on the clothes of the people who eventually were buried in the site at Santau. One of those two mechanisms suggests uh, how these objects have got into this site in Hong Kong. Based on those findings that we had in 2011, we realized that this was a, an important and interesting site, and it was probably worthy of a further season of fieldwork. Uh, and this time, rather than using the GPR for what you would say a prospection uh, phase of uh, survey, in other words, trying to find whether there is archaeology there, we use the GPR for a high-resolution survey to actually understand the detail of what was going on within the site. So this is two ways of using geophysical survey. One for prospection to find sites, the other way to find out the detail within sites with more uh, fine uh, resolution survey, in this case, half meter by half meter grid of survey using the GPR. And just over this time, just over eight five meter grids. So much more uh, dense survey, but over a smaller area, 200 meters square. And then we excavated a large rectangular trench, roughly about 36 meters squared in area. And that's the red outline you can see here, centered on this large anomaly in the middle. Here's the difference between those two things I've just talked about, between reconnaissance survey and definition survey. The, the data at the top is from 2011, from a one by one meter survey, quite coarse resolution data, and using uh, GPR processing software of an older kind, which actually introduces lots of what you would call artifacts into the data. So there's lots of these long tails to these anomalies. This has actually been created by the GPR. These are not necessarily archaeology. It's just the nature of the processing of the data. Here we've got state-of-the-art, newly, newly released processing data. The guys who did the GPR with us, Wallace Lai and his team, had just come back from a conference and been given this disk of this new software to process the data. So the first site they used it on was Santau. So we were incredibly lucky that it, this just happened at that time. So here we've got way, way, way finer, much clearer, better defined data. This is the same two areas that we're looking at here, and the data look quite different. This is because the GPR is high resolution at the bottom, and the processing is uh, done with um, state-of-the-art software. So it gave us a very good result. We've got this long string of anomalies here uh, on this left-hand side of the surveyed area, and we thought that looked like the most interesting area to go and look at for our second season of excavation. So we wanted to... Uh, key objectives of the second campaign was to further explore the potential of GPR for defining uh, these graves and for 3D modeling uh, the GPR data to see what that could do for us as far as the archaeology goes. Refine our excavation uh, testing of targets identified by GPR and develop a better understanding of how GPR was working uh, in terms of predicting what is below the ground. Because this obviously has a uh, future application in archaeological work in Hong Kong and can be used as a predictive tool based on what the GPR turns up, people might be able to say, without digging holes, roughly what might be below the ground. So this is a huge advantage in terms of future planning of archaeological work. Um, and we also wanted to understand more about the, uh, the character of Tang Dynasty activity and see whether we could find any evidence for continuity or change between it and these overlying Song deposits, which were very poorly defined in the first excavation because of Qing Dynasty agricultural disturbance. We hoped there was better preser uh, preservation in the western side of the site. So when we excavated that large trench in uh, the western part of the site, we found more graves with large iron weapons in. Interestingly, also northwest, southeast orientated, the same as the grave with the three 
uh, long blades in the first excavation, and also the same orientation as the grave with the large axe in as well. So these graves with the large iron objects share the same alignment, suggesting to me that they are of the same phase. They relate to the same um, contemporary phase of activity in the cemetery. Very interesting. And all these graves, apart from G2, had quite a few pots in, but these other graves had very few pottery grave goods, just these large metal objects. Uh, in this case, a, a kind of uh, one large storage jar and a small bowl, and these two long blades. This one more of a cleaver-like single-edged blade. With a, this is the tang rather than the, the point of the blade, so this would be mounted into a handle. It would be a blunt-ended chopping weapon. The most exciting grave of the lot, really, um, is Grave 17, which is the only one we found in the two seasons, which is orientated southwest, northeast. So we have graves that, uh, the earliest graves appear to be east-west, then the next ones are north-south, and then northwest-southeast, and then the most recent graves, G17, is orientated southwest, northeast. So a unique orientation so far, and a uniquely rich burial, including this very nice object here, which is an offcut of a silver inscribed ingot. Uh, this is an object that would not be uh, cash currency. This is on a different level to the Hoyun Tombo coin. They are the everyday currency of the Tang Dynasty. This is an object that is used for significant transactions, taxation, uh, land sales, mercantile activity, this kind of thing you would use, these kinds of uh, silver ingots to pay for significant transactions. This is not everyday currency, so very interesting. Also in the grave, several very nice uh, bowls, and cups, and a storage jar, and this very nice green glass fingering. That was a, an interesting uh, find because it's actually in this small pit, which was a secondary insertion into that grave after the grave had been completely backfilled. So somebody has come along later, inserted a small bucket-shaped pit into the fill of the grave and put two coins in it and a man-size green glass fingering. Very interesting. What it means, we don't know, but it's obviously a very interesting deposit and probably relates to the original burial and maybe somebody with a connection to that person or Maybe they found the ring after the person was buried and decided to put it in the grave with the, with the deceased person. It could be something as simple as that. We don't know, but it's a very interesting find. Now here's a, a proper look at that inscribed ingot. Um, very nice. Reading vertically from right to left, Wan Sui Dun Zhou, which refers, we think, to the Empress Wu Zhou of AD 690 to 705. And she had two different reign titles which would fit with this inscribed ingot. One was Wan Sui Deng Feng, and the other one was Wan Sui Tong Tian. Both of those could be uh, the person that this uh, ingot is referring to, and that places it early in the Tang Dynasty. Everything else on the site, apart from that round-bodied, uh, probably Jin Dynasty pot, everything else on the site is probably middle to later Tang. This object is early Tang, but this kind of thing was in circulation for a long time. This is, this is a, an object that was circulating and being used over an extended period of time. Um, the Dunzhou part of the inscription refers to a place uh, in today's Zhaoqing uh, on the Xijiang uh, West River in western Guangdong. So this is another connection with inland Guangdong, and this should be the place where this uh, silver ingot was minted. It was minted in Dunzhou um, in the period of this particular empress of the Tang Dynasty. So a really nice, really nice object. And as far as I know, also unique in this, in this region. The grave goods from uh, that grave, again, we've got indications that here is somebody of some status. They've got this ingot, they've got this green glass ring, which is a fairly unusual object. They've also got seven bowls and a cup buried with them, the latest of which is probably late Tang to early Northern Song in date, this one with this stepped uh, base. The rest are more typically late Tang in date. Quite uh, a, a regular uh, feature of Tang Dynasty bowls is that they are stacked using small clay pads in the kiln, and it quite often leaves these small spurs in the base of the pot. And that's what these, these are here. These are from the firing process 
of making these in the kilns in Guangdong. Now, when we look at the GPR data from the 2012 high-resolution GPR, and we compare that with the, with the Tang Dynasty features in the, in the bottom of this excavation, we get a quite an interesting correlation. We've got this northwest-southeast grave here, G18, which has this very high response here in the middle, which is where those iron blades were. We have, in the middle, a northern Song pit, which was full of large rounded stones, which is also being picked up by the GPR, so it's detecting this dense material as well. So it's not just metallic objects, it will pick up stone as well. And then down here we have another grave, G19, which was only partially excavated in the corner of the trench, again with a cluster of iron uh, weapons. And again, this is being picked up with this very strong response by the GPR. Other responses in here, here is the location of that um, silver ingot and also a fragment of an iron blade and a number of Hoyung Tongbo coins. So again, this is being picked up by the GPR. This kind of tail here, we couldn't really tie that to anything apart from possibly some kiln debris, which also shows up quite strongly in the GPR data. And this is at 63 centimeters depth. The TS25 refers to a time slice. So the GPR data can be expressed in, in a series of time slices going deeper and deeper into the site. And this is at 63 centimeters depth. And this is the frequency of the GPR that we're using, 900 megahertz. Now, compared to the first excavation, the 2012 dig turned up very good preservation of northern Song deposits. So whereas the Qing uh, agricultural terracing had destroyed and mixed the Song dynasty deposits at the eastern end of the site, at the western end, we've got several substantial pits, uh, all with northern Song material. This is three intercutting pits here. Another pit here, this is the one with the, the stones in the middle, which showed up very strongly in the GPR. A huge pit here full of kiln debris uh, and, and burnt stone. And then these ones with a Q, these are Qing Dynasty, we think, planting pits from fairly recent agricultural activity, which have cut down into the Song Dynasty deposit. But good preservation compared to the other, the other end of the site. At the northern end of the site, then, we had this very intense spread of kiln debris. This usually relates to Tang Dynasty kilns, traditionally related to lime uh, production, but also, I think, relating to salt production. Um, and this spread of burnt kiln debris and burnt stones gave a very strong response as well in the GPR data. And these are very typical uh, northern song uh, pottery here, a uh, nice uh, dish with a kind of stepped rim, and then, oops, sorry, and a base here of another bowl, very typical northern song uh, finds. When we look at the GPR data for that area at the northern end of the site, here we see this really strong response reflecting that dense scatter of kiln debris. When a kiln is fired, um, all of the iron in the fabric of the kiln aligns on the Earth's magnetic field. So it becomes like a huge bar magnet. So when that material is then uh, spread around after the kiln is destroyed, it still carries this very strong magnetic signal. And this is what the GPR is picking up, the density of the actual clay itself, but also the fact that it's, it's actually picking it up like it's an iron object with a very high conductivity. And here's the kind of what, what I would call the GPR excavation ground truthing cycle. Ground truthing is a way of taking the GPR or some other geophysical data and actually testing it by digging holes and finding out what that particular response in the GPR is relating to. What has caused this GPR response? This is called ground truthing. So here we've got the 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 study area, the GPR survey area. Here's that, re that big response from the Tang Dynasty graves. Here's a, a small detail of that area showing those responses. And then this is the area that was excavated to actually test that GPR data and find out what was actually causing that response. And the main thing causing it was these clusters of iron grave goods. So what this uh, means for future work is that GPR based on laboratory experiments which uh, Dr. Lai, uh, Wallace Lai at uh, PolyU is doing, or has been doing during this project and continues to do, is testing how these responses in the GPR relate to known archaeological materials. So by combining the GPR with the excavation, we're actually creating a predictive tool for archaeologists to use this technology in future and have some understanding of what might be buried in sites without actually digging holes. You would still dig holes to find out what was there eventually, 
but it allows you to get some understanding without actually having to dig holes in the first place. So Santau, what does it all mean? Well, I think we can quite safely say this is not a cemetery for local villagers or fisher folk. Um, we have some evidence for status. We have some graves that certainly look like warriors or uh, with a military connection. We have other graves which have virtually no weapons at all, but have quite a few coins. So maybe civilians as well. Interestingly, the graves on the northwest southeast orientation are all the ones with the weapons in. They're all of a shared alignment. The civilian graves are of a different alignment. So that's interesting in itself. We have these artifactual connections. Some of the things that we're finding suggest some connection with the sea, with maritime uh, activities, fish hooks, harpoons, as well as the adzes. Adzes were found in two separate graves. So these are woodworking tools that could be relating to doing repairs on boats. So there may be some maritime connection there. Intercutting graves, graves that cut into each other on four different orientations. Now this suggests different phases of use by different groups of people with different traditions. And it also su suggests probably change through time. So the southeast north, uh, southwest northeast grave, the latest one, G17, is orientated uh, southwest northeast. Uh, the other ones are on these three different alignments. And they, the graves of the same alignment, none of them cut into each other, which is very important. So all the northwest southeast graves are respecting each other. All the north south graves respect each other. And s the same with the other orientations. The ones from different phases do cut each other, which suggests that maybe when the graveyard is in use by a particular group using a particular orientation, which may be changed through time due to things such as Fong Soi, there could have been a particular auspicious orientation for graves at a particular time, and that changed through time. Um, what it suggests when you see graves intercutting with each other is that when the second grave came along, the people came along to bury their deceased relative or friend or comrade, the other grave was not visible anymore. It's highly unlikely that they would dig into a known grave, um, so it suggests that the, the grave mound was already gone and the grave was invisible on the surface, and therefore the people came along later and cut into the earlier graves. Yeah, contemporary, so graves on the same alignment, the northwest, southeast, I think are probably contemporary. They're probably relating to a military use, a military phase of use of this cemetery. Now, the location of this cemetery on the north coast of Lantau, looking out towards Chunmun and the Pearl River, next to Tongchung Bay, which is a very secure, sheltered anchorage for your war junks in case of storms attacking Chunmun, this would be a good place to have a cemetery relating to that military garrison. So there might be some connection there. It's possible. Uh, again, with the, the northern connections with the, the fine belt fittings, Again, are we looking at people moving around this coastal area on boats, uh, whether military or traders, and somehow using this cemetery um, for people who are not living in the area? Somebody dies while they're in this area, they, they're allowed to use that cemetery, possibly. We have this unique ritual behavior, this pot smashing. As far as I know so far, we haven't found any other examples of this, but there may be some in the Pearl River Delta or further afield in China. We need to do more research on that. And we also need to do more research on the artifacts, the weapons, the belt fittings, the silver ingot. Uh, the inscribed ingot is one of many smaller, there are many smaller pieces from these kind of things as well found in this cemetery. So that's the kind of thing we need to look at. So that's Santau. If you have questions on that, keep them in mind. We'll just now have a quick look at this year's proposed project, which is uh, at a very interesting location, uh, the island of Yim Tin Jai little salt field um, off Sai Kung um, with a very interesting history. Here is where the island is, just here in the edge of inner port shelter. Here's Sai Kung town, here's Khao Sai Chow, where some of you may play golf, so it's just off there. So the history of this small island, settled by the Hakka clan, uh, the Hakka Chan clan in the 18th century, we think, and they established a salt field and a village. This is uh, the salt field you can see in the background in a natural enclosed shallow bay. The suggestion is that the people arrived, these uh, hacker people arrived as salt workers with this knowledge 
found this site and recognized that this would be a great location to work salt. So they chose this island with its sheltered bay and converted it for use as a salt field. In this photograph here, in the foreground, we've got uh, the abandoned paddy fields of the village, and then in the background you can see the disturbed area. That is the salt field. Now, this island has a very interesting history in terms of uh, religion. Um, the island was an early site of Chinese, mission, Chinese Catholic missionary work in the 19th century. Uh, the Catholic missions, missionaries were very active in the Saikung region in Hong Kong at this time, and the community on Yim Tin Tai eventually, as an entire community, converted to Catholicism. And not only that, but they gave the Chan Ancestral Hall for use as a chapel. Now, if anybody who knows about local um, culture, traditional culture, in terms of the Ancestral Hall, that is the major focus of the clan's activities uh, in that community, particularly in a village like this, which didn't have um, a temple. Um, so to, if, you, if you needed a tangible um, indication of the faith of this group of people, they gave their ancestral hall for use as a Catholic chapel. That says it all, really. I think that's very interesting. So an early uh, missionary called uh, Father Joseph Brian Adametz came over to the island in the uh, late 19th century, and he established this uh, Catholic community, converted the ancestral hall into um, a chapel, and actually lived in this small end room, which would have been originally the side chamber of the ancestral hall was where the priest lived. And then this, in the foreground, was the ancestral hall main building, which was then used as a Catholic chapel. So a very interesting story there. Now, just been teaching my students about landscape survey and the use of space satellite imagery. Well, here's a satellite image of Yim Tin Tai from Google Earth, taken from the Landsat satellite, showing the island as it is today. Here's the uh, the salt field with its long salt uh, beds here, the small bund which they built across. This is a small natural bay and they put a barrier across it with sluices to control the flow of water to allow the salt water in, close it, let it uh, evaporate, and then let the, uh, the leftover water out. Here is the chapel, the, the existing chapel, uh, St. Joseph's Chapel, which is still roofed and used today. Um, in the 1970s, by the 1970s, this uh, community, like many in more remote areas of Hong Kong, was under stress. Um, many villagers had moved abroad, uh, other villagers had moved to Hong Kong, and it, the island became unsustainable um, as a, a traditional rice farming, salt farming community. Salt was much more cheaply and widely available from around the turn of the 19th century, and it was uh, eventually the entire community vacated the island and many of them now actually live in the UK, in Manchester and Leeds, which, oddly enough, is my hometown. Um, so these people from this small island in a remote part of uh, Hong Kong, many of them now live in my hometown. I think that's quite strange. Um, the earlier archaeological interest, so we have this interest relating to this um, Han, this Hakka community, dating to the Qing dynasty, converting to Catholicism, with this ancestral hall being converted to use as a chapel. So that is an interesting building, that's a ruin, and the villagers are now returning to the island and trying to rejuvenate the island and reinstate that chapel as a ruin for use as a, a place of religious pilgrimage. Um, while they're doing that, we're going to go in and do some sample excavation within the chapel, look for evidence of its original use of, as an ancestral hall, any evidence of its use in that later phase uh, as a Catholic chapel, and present that information to the villagers for their use and also obviously uh, in a report for the society and for the, the public of Hong Kong. So that should be an interesting piece of research. The other piece of research that we want to do on this island relates to its earlier archaeological interest um, from pre-war discoveries by amateur archaeologists, probably district officers like Walter Schofield, who should have actually been going around doing work in the villages, but they spent a lot of their time looking for geological samples and finding archaeology. And they identified on this island, in this northern area, which is now heavily overgrown, Ryant, um, this area here was an area of exposed terrace fields. This is where they found the prehistoric archaeology, but nobody's been able to find it since. We're going to try and find it, so that's the plan. 
Here's what that area looked like in 1963. Completely free of trees, lots of long terraced fields, and this is what it would, must have looked like pre-war as well when the archaeologists went in there and found evidence for prehistoric activity. So we have these very well-defined uh, terrace fields in the foreground. Here is the village and the chapel of St. Joseph here, and then the paddy fields and the salt field in the middle, and also some further terrace fields. This is 1963, so this is, this is getting towards the end of the life of the village when it's becoming very difficult to support the community with the land that is available, so they're expanding the areas of terrace fields to try and grow more crops. Now, the geology is very interesting because the geology of this island is three parts. Quaternary alluvium in that small bay relating to the salt field. Uh, this JHI, which is relating to volcanic tufts, um, ejected uh, volcanic material. The most interesting thing, though, is the rhyolitic lava flows. Rhyolitic lava flows, this is the JCB, which just happens to be the area where they found all the archaeology and where all the terrace fields were, or the majority of them, this is a very important raw material source in prehistoric sites in Hong Kong. Local people loved rhyolite because it's, it's almost glassy in the way that it uh, forms. So you can chip it and make very sharp edged tools with it. So prehistoric people in Hong Kong focused on areas with rhyolite as a, as a raw material source so they could make stone tools. So it's possible that the archaeological interest in that JCB, this area of rhyolite in the northern part of the island relates to the possibility of there being a quarry or a workshop area where they were looking for this specific stone to make stone tools. This is a speculation. I hope we can answer that question when we go in there and find some evidence this year. That's the plan. So three previous excavations, uh, three previous investigations have occurred. There's that walking over the island in the pre-war period, finding some materials in those terrace fields, prehistoric pottery, probably stone tools as well. And then two territory-wide surveys have both visited the island, but this is during the period when it was already long abandoned and heavily overgrown, and I suspect they didn't probably try quite hard enough to get into that northern terraced area and really have a look for those prehistoric remains. So we're going to go in there and try and find some evidence for that prehistoric archaeology in this terraced area up here. So the, the stars will be auger tests, where we drill a core into the ground to test the sequence of deposits, and then some of those if we find anything interesting, we'll then do some small test pits, probably two by one meters, to actually characterize the nature of any deposits that we find. We'll also do some excavation inside the ruined chapel, which I'm get my mouse to work here, which is here. This is the ruined chapel, which was the ancestral hall. And we'll do some other testing around other parts of the island that haven't been looked at before to try and get a, a better baseline data set for this island, which at the moment is archaeologically quite blank. So we'll do 30 hand auger drills, uh, five test pits, and then in the uh, ruined chapel, we'll look to define the in internal features of the uh, structure, try and recover some finds relating to its different phases of use, and also get our surveyors out to produce some accurate surveyed elevations and plans of the building, to record the building, of, of, uh, record the ruins of the building. So, to round off some dates for the 2013 fieldwork, uh, site clearance work we will be doing over the weekend of Saturday and Sunday, the 26th and 27th of October. I imagine it will probably take all weekend because it's going to be very, very overgrown. Uh, we, we will just cut small corridors into the jungle to get to the point where we want to do our auger test, 